Well, thank you for that very smooth hang uh, handover, Al. Uh, wonderful to be here. Um, it's Friday, April 12th, and I'm Jamie Liddell, Outsource Editor, and you've already heard from Outsource Publisher Al Tepper back in the control room. Bit of a misnomer, perhaps. Uh, I'll be introducing our special guest very shortly, but as usual, we do want this to be a fully interactive webinar, so please do use the chat or question function on your webinar interface to send over any queries or thoughts to any of us here. A couple of points of interest first. Last week saw the publication of the digital issue of our latest magazine. So for those of you who haven't yet seen a copy of Outsource 31, there's a whole world of outsourcing and business transformation for leadership only a few clicks away. So if you go to our new look website at outsourcemagazine.co.uk and click on the digital editions tab in the top right and Bob's your uncle. Talking of our new look website, we've actually got a new look website. Please do check it out and let us know what you think. You can send any feedback on that, the latest mag, and anything else to me at the usual email address, jamie.liddell at outsourcemag.co.uk. Remember, too, that if you're not already following us on Twitter, you can do so at outsourcemag. And if you're on LinkedIn, which of course you are, you can join our group. Just search for Outsource Magazine Global Community and come on board. Okay, enough of the boring stuff. Let's get straight into the interview this week. I'm delighted to have with me today, or rather to be with today, Guy Kirkwood of Exchanging, who's a veritable legend, of course, in the outsourcing space. Guy is Exchanging's global head of advisor led business development and is bravely going to take questions on absolutely anything today. So, Guy, I'm looking forward to pinning you now specifically on the Korean Peninsula crisis and the ramifications of the election of the new Pope for the Falklands question. Please do again send any questions you might have to Guy via the question or chat function on your interface. Guy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Now, staying away for the moment from geopolitical crises, um, I thought we'd start off with a look at some global uh, questions anyway, most notably the emergence really and uh, uh, resilience, increasing resilience of uh, global business services as a model. The move from captive shared services models to GBS, is it worth it? Okay, uh, Joe, thank you very much indeed for the uh, for the uh, introduction, although uh, legend in my lunchtime perhaps, but no other no other reason for uh, for people listening to me. Um, however, uh, one thing that uh, increasingly uh, the market is looking at, and bear in mind that I'm talking to um, most of the third party advisor, consulting, and analyst organisations and individuals within it across the world, um, we are seeing an increase in the number of organisations that chose not to outsource, who to set up shared service and captive operations. Uh, all seem to be asking the same question, uh, and that question is, what the hell do we do now? Uh, the reason for that is that uh, over the last, um, some of these shared service operations have been running for the last 10 years, and uh, increasingly, the, um, they've driven all of the costs that they can out of the operation, and they've driven all the efficiencies in that they think they can do, and so they're now looking at what they can actually do. Um, now, in a lot of cases, that's down to um, consolidation, um, so they may have a shared service operation on uh, within um, HR, within finance and accounting, technology uh, and procurement, uh, and the more and more of these are being combined into um, global business services, or GBS, um, seems to be the, the flavor uh, description of the month. And then um, they're then saying, well, if we don't do that, what are the other alternatives? And the alternatives effectively boil down to three areas. One, the first one is to outsource the operations. Uh, and they can outsource that to a single service provider, although increasingly we are seeing um, organizations go down the multi-sourcing route, and certainly the advisors, and the amount of money that the advisors make on uh, large contracts uh, seems to be going down, uh, and it has been over the last two or three years, and I'm sure we'll come to that um, shortly. Uh, the second option is to uh, consolidate into these global business service units, uh, and then try and monetize that, in other words, sell those services uh, or sell those operations to um, uh, other competing organizations or indeed into the outsourcing market. And we've seen some examples of the, uh, the monetization of captives, um, uh, certainly over the last uh, three or four years, and I think that's going to increase. And the last area, which is probably of most interest to me, is the commercialization of these operations. So uh, in a number of um, circumstances, currently we, uh, must, my, my organization, are looking at working with client organizations to take what they've got, um, consolidate those into an operation, jointly fund the creation of a new co, new business, um, go through process improvement and Lean Six Sigma and all that good stuff to maximize the efficiency of the operation. And then instead of making the people in those operations redundant that are no longer required, what we do is we keep them and then we um, commercialize that operation. In other words, sell those services 
to synergistic organizations on a geographic or a sector basis. So those, those three options really are, um, are being looked at by um, financial services organizations, one in particular we're talking to in a geography outside where we normally operate. Uh, we're also looking at uh, numerous manufacturing organizations who have operations on a regional basis. So we're looking at regional hubs in uh, North America or in Central America, in um, Central Europe tends to be, and also in um, Southeast Asia, which will um, operate under the, uh, the Asia Pac market. Interestingly enough, um, our operation in Singapore uh, is a case in point whereby we're known over there as a, a technology um, provider based on our, one of our acquisitions. But increasingly, we're moving into the BPO um, market over there. And if you consider that finance and accounting in France, there are um, five captive finance and accounting shared service operations based in France. In Singapore, um, for those of you who know the UK, is about the size of the Isle of Wight, there are 230. So the opportunity to grow a BPO business and a synergistic commercialized operation in Singapore is something that we're looking very strongly at. There's a couple of things I want to pick up on there. Um, to going as a, as a JV with a, with a captive and obviously applying some of the, uh, some of the things that your organization has learned over the years. And, you know, you, you mentioned Lean Six Sigma, you mentioned driving efficiencies, but then uh, you were also talking about this being a question for companies who might have driven all the efficiencies already out of there. So are you saying that, well, obviously there are things that you could do perhaps that they won't be able to anyway, but are you saying that the, by the very nature of going into partnership with an organization like yourself there opens up new doors for efficiencies and for savings? Yes, uh, absolutely correct. And, uh, and that's basically driven around, um, in our case, uh, around the, the strength of our procurement business. Um, procurement is probably the fastest growing of our uh, of our businesses. Um, it is a true global franchise, and more importantly, it operates um, full source to pay. So it includes all of the FMA activity as well. And um, we literally put our money where our mouth is. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about exchanging, but the um, uh, the, the ability of the organisation to actually take on um, operations and using uh, performance improvements uh, and continuous improvements, Lean Six Sigma, we were able to drive uh, demonstrable changes and uh, improvements in, in cost savings um, through the organizations that feel as though they've done it. Uh, and in, depending on the maturity of the organization, what we're finding is that those that are more mature um, will actually operate on a gain share model. So we, were, we are happy to take a 100% gain share um, commercial model with, with clients who think they've already driven most of the savings that they can out of, uh, say, a procurement and F&A operation. And we're still able to drive between 20 and 30 percent additional savings out of that operation. So yes, we are seeing that very much. Do you think there's going to be um, a, an explosion, maybe a, a, an increase, certainly, in the number of, uh, of carve-outs, whether or not as part of a joint venture with the likes of yourselves, or as, uh, you know, in terms of a, a, a sort of whole new entity being created, maybe purchased and developed, as was the case with WNS, for example, or maybe uh, developed by the by the organisation, by the buyer side also itself. Do you see there being a new wave of car bounce? And if so, what's the impact for the provider market? Well, I mean, uh, if we look at the, the provider market, yesterday there were two uh, sets of data, one produced by Nelson Hall uh, and the other one by KPMG looking at Q1 2013. And the outsourcing market has literally fallen off a cliff. Um, we've got the smallest number of outsourcing deals um, since you know, quarter by quarter since 2006. Um, and uh, most of the activity that's taken place in the market has all been re-signatures uh, and transformational deals as opposed to new deals from new clients. So any carve-out activity will actually add to the world of the outsourcing service providers. Um, if we go slightly further back, and you look at the, the creation of Genpact or Jekis as it was originally out of GE, that type of business model works extremely well, but you need to have first mover advantage. And I think the use of technology uh, in its broadest sense uh, to actually facilitate that process, and we look at organizations like Brew Prism and an organization we're working with called Machine Shop, then uh, you've got organizations there that can provide uh, the technology services over in, within the cloud uh, at a much lower cost than using the classic ERP type uh, activity from SAP Oracle and so on. The provider market, and again, I'm not wanting to put you on any particularly sticky ground, but as you say, there's, there's 
you know, there, there, there is a certain degree of woe facing supplier disclosure at the moment, possibly as a result of the fact that there might not be a lot of business uh, to be had, a lot of new business to be had. Is that a consequence of the gloomy economy that we're in, or is it a consequence maybe of all the low hanging fruit having disappeared, or are there other factors? Maybe people aren't necessarily ready to make that investment. I mean, what, what, what's at the core of this? I, I think uh, it, depends on, it depends on two things. One is the, uh, the sector we're talking about, and the other one is the geography. Um, looking at the figures that uh, were announced yesterday, um, there is a definite flattening or, in fact, reduction in the number of, uh, of outsourcing deals across the world. So we're not looking at anything um, that's particularly peculiar to the North American market or indeed the European market. And even the number of deals in, um, signed in Q1 in Asia-Pac were also down. I think it's, there are two elements. One is that the, if you look at the majority of where those contracts uh, or majority of um, contracts that are signed, you're looking at two market sectors. One is public sector and the other one is financial services. In both of those, we've seen dramatic decrease in the amount of money organizations have to spend on transformation. So I think service providers have got to look at ways that they can actually generate, and the advisors actually, have got to look at the way that they can generate revenue um, from a zero start. Because organizations are not in a position to invest in a large ERP platform now, as they were sort of five, ten years ago. And so you're, you're looking at the service providers having to come up with new innovative commercial models to allow them to actually um, work more effectively. And if you add into that the, um, the advisor market, the advisory market has contracted, um, again, dramatically over the last uh, three, four, five years. Uh, and this is a case uh, that size really does not matter. Uh, in this market. It doesn't matter whether you're working for a Deloitte KPMG bearing point or whether you're working for a two-man band. Um, it's the relationship that that individual consultant has with the C-suite that is actually driving activity. At the time when ISG um, or Equiterra, TPI um, uh, type of activity, time when they could put 10 people onto a deal for, 30, you know, for 18 months and charge one and a half million dollars has gone completely. So it's very much a, a light touch um, mentality in that market, and that's driving some of the multi-source behavior that we're seeing, because the clients increasingly want to see value add, as opposed to just saying, yes, you can go and use service provider X, Y, and Z, and the clients, because they're more mature now, are turning around and saying, yes, great, we could have told you that, so what? Which, great conversation to be a fly on the wall, perhaps, or not to be part of. Um, you're looking at, you know, a number of different trends there, which obviously are having a quite serious ramifications for all sides of the outsourcing space. Um, one of them, which you didn't sort of pick up on there, but I think is quite closely related to that, obviously, is the labor arbitrage question. And that brings in, uh, you know, questions about existing providers' business models, certainly, um, you know, some of the more uh, India-centric players with, with huge warehouse-type models um, must be quaking in their boots right now. And I think that's probably fair to say for, for quite a few organizations. Um, I mean, firstly, is labor arbitrage dead? And secondly, if so, or if it's on its last legs, where, where next? Okay. Um, labor arbitrage, I think, is dead. Uh, if it isn't dead now, it will be, it's, it's in the process of dying, croaking its last. Um, and for instance, within our organization, we've got people in Bangalore who are now more expensive than our people in Preston. Um, and so, therefore, organizations have to look at either moving to um, tier three locations. Um, I define tier three location as as one of having a university but no airport. Um, so the, uh, you have a captive audience, so literally a captive audience, because mm -hmm. in certain circumstances it takes five hours to get there on a bus. Mm -hmm. So, but more and more organizations are looking at um, Central European locations, much more looking at Singapore and Malaysia, um, hence the, uh, the number of shared service operations in Singapore. Um, and they are looking at Central America as, uh, as key areas where there is still a labor benefit, a labor charge benefit of using those locations. But what we're increasingly seeing is the obvious, uh, the, the, um, where the, the people themselves are not needed. So um, Blue Prison is a good example of that. Um, and also um, a Machine Shop is another example. So where organizations are now saying, what services can we get provided through the cloud whereby we don't need any people to do it? So there's, rather than it being a, an offshoring, a nearshoring, an onshoring model, maybe there's a no-shoring yeah. uh, option. 
But the service providers, the large service providers, the Indian heritage ones particularly, I believe are actually going to be in difficulty over the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. Because you know, being pejorative, if, the, if there's a problem in throwing bodies at it, there's an awful lot of bodies on the bench if they're, if they're not going to deal through it and the, and the growth revenue that they're expecting. So, and that's also being driven by the increase in multi-sourcing and the use of, of um, niche providers that have the capability to provide a, a sort of, I hate the word best of breed, but you know what I mean, um, capability that specializes in the niche area. So within the HR space, uh, then that, that an organization like Workday would fit very well in that. I mean, if, if you look at what that implies for for the end user, for example, um, it, it, it seems to me that we're going to be having a lot of uh, a lot of organisations who will be dealing with a great number of different suppliers. I mean, it might not even be what you call a multi-sourcing model because it will be totally cloud delivery as a service. Uh, in the same way as I use Gmail personally, uh, it might be that an organisation will have different functions being served by many many different cloud provisions, um, and that that kind of undermines the need for an outsourced provider altogether, doesn't it? I mean, from, from the perspective, if you're, if you're driving everything through technology, where, where, does, that, where does that leave exchanging? Exchanging, for example. Um, well, if we, if we look at the market generally rather, rather than exchanging, I mean, the, yes, I agree that it won't be the outsourcing service providers that are providing that management. Service managed operation tends to be the advisor and the consulting community. Mm -hmm. Because they've got the capability. A lot of them have come out of industry, so the best consultants have uh, three um, three areas within their careers. They work with on the buy side, so they work with organisations, so they understand the internal dynamics. They work with service providers, so they can understand what's what the ask for possible is, uh, and the commercial models. And they've worked on the advisory side, so they they come across very well and are able to articulate the ideas to the C-suite. Um, so. If you look at a, a downturn in the number of and the quality of the outsourcing service provider community, I think over the next 18 months, two years, we're going to see an increase in the number of those managed service operations being driven by the KPMGs, mm -hmm. by the bearing points, by the Deloitte's, as they move their business model. So I said earlier that if you look at the amount of money that consultants are making from the transaction, which is traditionally where TPI and Equiterra made their mm -hmm. money, then that's come right down. So they're looking very much at the front end strategy side, looking at where Bain, Booz, McKinsey would work, and the governance side, so the management of those of those operations and the management of the of the service provider community. Um, but there are very few organisations on the service provider side that are willing to let them in, mm. and they see them as the enemy there. Sure. And I think that's totally wrong. What are the implications for the kind of person that's required in the retained team, if you're moving from a, for want of a better phrase, a warehouse model where you're still having a great number of people, it's just they don't necessarily work for you anymore, and something like uh, the food prism or the machine shop, I mean, is, is there a categorical difference in who's required actually within the organization still? Um, everyone talks about, I mean, I, my, my background is within HR outsourcing, so everyone talks about HR as an example being uh, wanting to get into the position where they were a business partner. Um, no one actually did it, um, but that was the aim. I think that the activity we're seeing in the market now is driving the need for business partners. And um, the best example, there are a couple of examples, um, one very old one actually, um, whereby uh, there was a chap with John Patchen who worked for um, CSD, and this was a time when the uh, British Airways, sorry, British Aerospace was outsourcing their technology uh, in the, uh, I think it was the mid-90s, it might have been earlier than that actually. Um, and uh, IBM did what they normally do, and they won the deal from underneath um, CSC's nose. But Deutsche very cleverly said, um, yes, IBM, you're going to win the deal, but we want John Patching to work with you to deliver the project, because we think that the CSC guys are better than your guys. Um, then they did something, and so IBM hired him. Then they did something very clever, and they said, well, actually, we're going to hire John Patching to be the policeman against you, because he's going to know everything that you're going to try and do to change control us. And that was a very effective way of managing the relationship with one service provider then, uh, now multiple service providers, where someone has that capability to manage that process and manage those, those contracts. Um, and if you look at contracts at the moment, contracts evolve over time. Um, and traditionally, after three and a half years and a five-year deal, 
the, uh, the account team will go to the client and say, right, Mr. Client, we've got some fantastic whiz bang ideas for you, and by the way, do you want to extend the contract? Uh, and the client quite rightly turns around and says, well, why didn't you come and talk to me about this three years ago? So by having the internal business partner role, part of the governance structure that's built into the more intelligent contracts, then you can change the contract over time to achieve what the client needs as opposed to what they originally contracted for. Um, and that is something that we're seeing, uh, seeing develop um, quite dramatically over the next, uh, well, now and, and in the future. Okay. Um, well, shortly, we're going to hand over to Al for, for a couple of questions. Um, I just wanted to, you know, you've, you've talked about the changing role of the, the advisor and, and obviously driven to a certain extent by decreasing revenues and, 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 the, and the changing landscape there. Um, can, can you just, I mean, there's a couple of things I want to ask you. What, one of them is, uh, do you think that the advisory market is in crisis right now, however you want to phrase that, and what's the ramifications? And secondly, I know, I know that you guys are doing some quite clever things in terms of the way you work with advisors, so I'd like a little bit of insight into that. I mean, what's, it, what's your take on what, where the advisors sit? Okay, I mean, I, I've come to some of this anyway, but the, the advisors are moving into the strategy space, so they are talking to the clients, not at the stage when they say, we want to outsource it, we talk to them, but at the stage when the client is saying, we've got a problem, we don't know what to do about it. That's critically important in dealing with the service providers because the earlier the service providers can find out what's going on, the better the deal that can be shaped. And I'm such a believer that deals done with third party advisors are better than deals done without, that if we're in a sole source position, I will actually introduce someone to that, even if it means opening it up to competition. So dealing with the advisory market in a, in a, in a more much more open way and in a much less combative way is something that's being driven both by the service providers or the more mature service providers and the advisory organizations themselves, mm -hmm. because they are opening up their kimono now, because they have to. Mm -hmm. They can't generate all the revenue they need to support the structures that they've created just under their own auspices. So they need to work much more closely with the service providers. That doesn't mean that they get embedded with one or two organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, my, that's where I'm going. Yeah, because, uh, because that, that is counterproductive, and they need to retain their independence. So for every third party advisor led deal that we do, uh, we're actually creating a governance structure that, depending on the size of the deal, interfaces chief exec to chief exec, all the way down through the operational teams. But critically, we want a third-party advisor on that governance board. Why? Because they're like priests were 200 years ago. They know about what's happening in the market before it happens. That's their bread and butter. They know what's happening. So they can say, right, Miss Client, your contract is going to take you to position N by the time at the end of the contract, because that's what you contracted. But your market is doing this, your your competitors are doing that, and therefore you need to move to point P instead. Now, for a lot of service providers, the more traditional, um, more monolithic organizations, they would see that as an opportunity to change control, the client's debt. Uh, and we've seen that happen numerous times. The more mature, the, the, the less mature, the more agile organizations are saying, we will actually adapt our contracts um, without change control so that you get to what you need. And that achieves three things. The first one is that it achieves huge shareholder value increase for the, for the, um, for the client, mm -hmm. because they get to where they need to go as opposed to where they originally contracted. For the service provider, it's good news, because it means that they are treated as a true partner mm -hmm. as opposed to a vendor. And it allows them, frankly, to want to sell it up somewhere more quickly. Yeah. And for the third party advisor, that is the holy grail. That is annuity revenue for the life of the contract. Um, and there are very few organizations, I was talking to Gartland this morning, very few organizations um, that actually um, can see that that's the future. Because it means that the contract size, uh, in other words, the size of the contract, the physical contract, mm -hmm. can be much smaller because the governance structure will flex with the need of the client, as opposed to always going back to the contract to decide what was the most appropriate action, even when it becomes obsolete. Obviously, looking forward to kind of observing that as it, as it plays out, um, um, and we'll obviously be keen to see all the advisors coming to box your door on that basis as well. Um, we're going to just go back to the control room, uh, Al, if you're, if you're there. Have you uh, probably got a couple of questions from the audience by now? Uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me uh, over there? Yes? Jamie? Yeah, Al, Al, Al. Al. Excellent, excellent. Just checking after earlier after the earlier snafu uh, with a bit of tech, I do apologize. Um, uh, I do have one question. Uh, it's from a Malcolm. Uh, he has made quite an interesting point. Obviously, he talked uh, it's, it's 
reaching into what you were talking about arbitrage, I guess, has inspired the following. Uh, given the state of the European Union and the state of uh, the countries within it, specifically looking at places like Greece, uh, don't you see a significant uh, reinvigoration of arbitrage, especially heading back? I mean, given that uh, he didn't add this in, but given that Preston, I mean, you gave an example, Guy, uh, Preston is uh, obviously cheaper than some of your some of your seats in Bangalore uh, or where, wherever you mentioned. Uh, aren't we going to see a resurgence of arbitrage? I guess that's his ultimate point. Okay. Um, yes, but not yet. Um, I think that there is a risk element with going uh, and putting large operations in um, in countries that have been hit particularly badly with the uh, with the uh, eurozone crisis. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is that it takes a lot of investment to set up operations, uh, including um, operating with the banks within geographies where you're not completely sure whether that money is going to disappear. Um, I won't mention any names, Cyprus, um, but there is a there is a risk element to that that is probably too um, what's the word uh, vehement, I suppose to allow uh, that type of operation to happen. Now, we actually have operations in, uh, in Italy, um, and uh, we've actually made an acquisition in Italy, uh, just made one, um, to, within the banking market. So um, we, there are organizations that are investing um, in those geographies. Um, we're also seeing a quite a lot of activity with the Spanish banks um, and, the, uh, and the government um, for exactly the reason that, uh, that um, they're trying to sort themselves out after the Eurozone crisis. Now, whether that drives increased um, captive and shared service operation and indeed outsourcing operations in, um, in those geographies, I'm, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't see it at the moment. Um, but that's not to say it's not happening. Um, you probably need to speak to one of the advisors uh, actually based in that geography that, uh, uh, that will be able to answer that question. So the answer is very long-winded. Uh, the answer is yes, but not yet. Just, just on that point, Brian, obviously at the moment it's Eurozone, but we are still globally in quite an interesting uh, economic phase. Uh, and I think the head of the IMF was warning about a three-speed world at the moment. Um, some of the uh, more prominent, uh, I guess, kind of more labor arbitrage attractive locations that have arisen over the last two decades uh, aren't necessarily the most financially stable places, but people have been willing to take a punt to a certain extent because of how cheap they are. Um, Firstly, do you see there being a danger with uh, with other economies kind of tanking, I guess, and there being a sort of a return to the darker days of the crisis? And also, do you see that if perhaps things do get worse in Europe and continue to stay as so they are, that what you've just outlined, while being a pressing concern, might not be as pressing as the gains that might be available when wages actually do drop below a certain level? Uh, I think there are two elements. that, um, From a service provider perspective, then um, those organizations that are looking to make investments uh, and set up operations in geographies where there is a question over the, um, uh, the Eurozone crisis. For instance, I have a mortgage in France, um, which, uh, and we're not sure what's going to happen with the bank with that, um, is one question. The second, opera, uh, the second point is that, um, and it goes back to the days of Beirut, you know, I know someone who, um, during, the, uh, during the Civil War there, um, actually bought up entire blocks, um, even though um, he had to actually dodge the bullets to actually go and buy them, and made a fortune. So yes, there is there is a move to buy when there's blood on the streets, um, either literally or, uh, or metaphorically. Um, but I think that uh, the labor arbitrage as a result of that, if the infrastructure in certain circumstances not, it can't be guaranteed, um, is, uh, is, a, is a dodgy proposition. Um, the corollary to that is that um, you take organisations or take take geographies like Morocco. Uh, Morocco has seen a, a dramatic increase. I went to a, um, a presentation by the uh, the Morocco um, uh, consulate, and um, the, uh, and uh, there is a great deal of activity taking place in uh, in uh, Morocco, and there's a real appetite. Um, and one, one could say that North Africa is, is probably not a good place to uh, invest in the moment, but Morocco is very stable. Mm -hmm. I had the word stability uh, mentioned at least 15 times during mm -hmm. uh, a short presentation. So you take organizations. Now, that's not particularly low cost. Um, it's got a, uh, a, 
a primacy over the Spanish and French language market, um, but it is now increasingly looking at moving into the um, English-speaking Anglo-Saxon world as well. Just to chime in, uh, I have a second question, actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, there's a second question. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Jamie. Uh, from Jonathan, uh, uh, back onto labor arbitrage. Uh, will it not continue following demand and supply, for example, moving from India to China, uh, as China develops its capabilities whilst ma maintaining economic advantage? So looking east, Guy, arbitrage, still plenty of room to run out there? Uh, yes. I mean, China is um, great um, in every sense of the word. Um, there, you look at the largest service providers, they already have some massive operations in, uh, in, um, in China. Um, but again, a question from the labor arbitrage, I was speaking to someone uh, a couple of weeks ago about um, the Chinese market, and actually it works with the uh, United Nations. And the labor arbitrage uh, in Beijing and uh, associated area, Shanghai, um, actually has almost disappeared in comparison with India today. So even within the Chinese market, they're looking at provinces outside, uh, certainly to the west um, of the, uh, the collaborations, to actually provide uh, a labor arbitrage argument. So even in China, we're seeing a move um, west in that case to, uh, uh, for them. So I don't see that, that's a, that being a, um, a panacea to the market. Although the Chinese market itself is, is so enormous uh, and potentially um, so lucrative for organizations that it certainly cannot be ignored. They're certainly not being with us. I, I would like to hear from anyone uh, out there who has thoughts on China with uh, regards to a future article. And also, Malcolm, uh, I believe it was you with the first question. If you have any thoughts on, uh, for example, Greece, then please do drop me a line. Uh, my email address is jamie.ledell at outsourcemagazine.co.uk uh, as I'll be looking at the consequences of the Eurozone crisis in the next issue. Uh, Guy, I think we're probably looking to uh, draw things to an end now, so thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute delight. Uh, Guy Kirkwood, obviously looking to hear from any of you with any ideas uh, and uh, certainly interested in exchanging. His email address is guy.kirkwood at exchanging.com. I'm sure we'll be delighted to uh, hear directly from any of you guys. Um, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming along. Our next Outsource Extra webinar is, of course, at the same time next Friday, uh, so I look forward to speaking with you then, and we'll have announcements regarding our guest uh, over the next couple of days. Meanwhile, this uh, webinar will be online in audio format as of Monday, so if any of you or colleagues or acquaintances missed it, then they can register and uh, access this as of next week. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great weekend.